Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where I'm going to try my absolute darndest to answer your questions about mountain bike tech. So if you've got your own question that you want answered on this very show, get in the comments using the hashtag AskGMBNTech and hopefully we can get it on. Anyway, on with this week's questions. So first question this week is from Joe Finning and they say, Hi Dorian Henry, love the show, which is good to hear. I've been thinking about getting some more powerful brakes for my Nukeproof Scout, which currently has 180mm rotors and two pop brakes front and rear. My question is, should I get some four pot brakes front and rear or go four pot up front and two pot at the back, as it is a hardtail and I'm planning on doing a lot of downhill riding with it? Well, um, you're actually also adding an extra bit in your question here saying that the fork you're unsure about what the maximum rotor size for that fork would be. I would imagine you've got a 180mm adapter, but you could go up to a 200mm rotor with the correct adapter. I think with brakes, in terms of, um, you know, cost in terms of weight to performance offered, they're one of the most efficient places to find performance on your bike, especially with bigger rotors. So I would say big rotors give more power, and that's just that's for me often the first port of call. Secondly, I'd say you know four pot brakes are a great are a great way to increase power um, consistently consistency as well as modulation because they all kind of go hand in hand. Now um, with the two pot or four pot thing, I would just say four pot all over. I understand you know you know with with vehicles and stuff sometimes they put beefier brakes on the front and I get it. But I think also we drag brakes more on the back on our mountain bikes. So that kind of goes out the window. I would say if you can go four pots, brilliant. And if you can get yourself some bigger rotors, even better. I think 180 is, is a fair size for the back, but going to a 200, because what can happen is, because when you've got a 200mm rotor on the front, you're braking, you have, you have so much more access to, to better braking that then you don't drag the rear so much because your braking distance is just shortened so drastically. So it can in turn take the emphasis off the rear. So I hope that helps. The next question is from Alternate Account. This one should be steeped in mystery, I imagine. Why is the angle of the head tube so important? And why do different riders prefer different angles on their head tubes? What is the reasoning for different angles? What situations call for each standard and or custom angle? Um, I'll speak about it in kind of layman's terms. With, with, your, with your geometry, no one thing can really be viewed in isolation because they all are connected to one another. In the simplest terms, the more, the, the slacker your head tube angle, the more rearward your weight is going to sit. And it's going to be sitting it closer to behind the front axle, which means it's going to basically be driving the wheel forward as opposed to you pivoting around it. If you imagine if you had your weight incredibly far forward, almost you know, 90 degrees straight over that front axle, it would take such a small knock on that wheel to pitch you forward and straight over the bars. Similarly, if you had it at 45 degrees, you'd probably never, ever go over the bars. Now, stability in that manner, or at least, you know, that, that stable feeling you get from being able to just hit stuff and plow through it, is more apparent when you ride steeper trails because you have the gradient, you know, the way the, the bike will sit on that steeper trail, it will kind of suit that bike, that style of bike more. Um, so what can happen is when you want flatter trails and you haven't got that force driving behind the front axle, the, the kind of stability goes. Um, but like I said, it can't be viewed in isolation because things like chainstay length, you know, and, and, your, and your front centre in general also massively affect this. I think one of the things that people find when they ride bikes that are quite slack on trails that are a bit, uh, aren't quite as steep is they find that when they lean the bike, it does feel a bit less stable. It feels, um, you know, kind of wants to flop and fall over. Um, that, you know, it, it's, it's difficult because like I said, no, no thing can be, no one thing can be viewed in, um, in isolation, but that's largely the gist of it. Um, but there are many different aspects. Largely, it's just a way, it's just a way to affect where the weight sits on the bike, you know, more rearward or more forward. The next question is from Jonathan. He says, hello guys, I'm wondering if you can seat a new tire with a CO2 canister. In theory, it sounds like it should work. Well, yes, absolutely you can. CO2 canisters are a way that you can, you know, use a high pressure just to um, get that tire up onto the bead and airtight. But a lot of, um, tire sealants don't really like mingling with CO2. So that's worth something, that's something that's worth bearing in mind. So I would say if you do do that, 
Then just dump the CO2 afterwards and reinflate it using um, even just anything really, as long as it's up on the bead, it should be easy enough. And that will um, that'll be better for the long term. The next question is from Nick. And they say, hi, I have SLX brakes with fin pads and they rattle like good God. How would you silence them? Um, what I've seen people do is beneath the fin, you can put a bit of um, like Velcro tape just to, just to take up that bit of space and to, and to stop them moving around. Um, and I've heard people have had, you know, it's it really worked for them. But I imagine anything like that would, would kind of do. But um, Velcro tape seems to be what a lot of people are using. So I would suggest trying that. Now, the next question is from uh, Jorge. And they say, I'm having trouble with my DT Swiss new two shock. It gets hot on downhills. There's no DT Swiss service centers in my country, Mexico. I'm thinking of disassembling it and apply grease on the O-rings. Is SRAM butter compatible? Yes, SRAM butter will work nicely and it will really reduce the friction, which in turn will um, reduce the amount of heat going into that rear shock. So it sounds like a win-win situation. It sounds like a great idea to do. Now, the next question is from Harry. And they say, I would like to upgrade my fork travel from 130 to 150. I have a 2021 RockShox Revelation and the Stanction only has 130 and 140 measurements of travel indicated on it. Do I need to get new uppers and steer unit or can you upgrade the travel anyway? I would say, yeah, you would need to get new uppers. Some people say, oh, you can do it and it's absolutely fine. But what you're doing with, what you're doing is you're complicating it in a couple of ways. One, you're gonna have less bushing overlap. And that basically means the amount of tube that is sat inside the lowers, which is gonna affect stiffness, um, you know, as the bike is, you know, that initial part of the stroke, it's gonna essentially just prop it up on stilts. So it's gonna be less stiff, which is bad. It also means that the, on the inside of that fork leg, there's a small dimple, which lets the air migrate from the positive to the negative um, air chamber. Really, really important. And that's gonna move where that is in the stroke too which in turn will probably give you some complications to do with your air spring. And thirdly, I would say that when you, although these, um, a lot of the RockShox stuff does tend to come with very healthily sized dampers, what you can often do is when you go slightly longer on the spring side, if it goes longer than the damper, and sometimes they're closer than you might think in terms of, you know, they've only got maybe five or 10 mil spare in terms of damper length, then what that means is, when you're not bottoming out on the air spring, but you're actually bottoming out on the damper, it basically just pulls the damper apart and you cause some real damage. So I would say, don't do it. And if you do do it, do it by the book and go for those new uppers. Um, but whilst you're at it, it can be quite expensive. And you might look at maybe going for, you know, something like the Yari aforementioned, which is kind of similar to Revelation in a lot of ways, but a bit beefier. And when you get to longer travel applications, you're just gonna find it's a lot stiffer and stiffness with suspension often goes hand in hand with performance. Um, the next question is from Jeff and he says, can you explain the difference between integrated and internal headsets in detail? For example, pros, cons, which is better suited for which application and why most bikes use integrated? Well, yes, yeah, so you get the external type, which is kind of the more, um, which is the kind of like older, older standard, I guess. Um, and they're obviously very easy to identify because you can see the headset cup sitting externally where the bearings sit in is, is external. Now, the problem with that is it, it basically adds stack height. So, or at least it, it adds um, distance, maybe stack is probably the wrong term because that's another geometry dimension. But what, it, what, you, what you don't want to do, it's better to be able to basically say, here's 10 mil of spacer that the end user can swap out if they don't want, then give them mandatory height that they have to have. So, that's one of the reasons I think they've also kind of just gone out of fashion for, for various other ones. Then you get zero stack or semi-integrated, which is basically where you have a headset cup that is, sits flush within the head tube. This is my personal favorite. If, you, if anyone is <laughs> pathetic enough to have a favorite headset standard, that's my favorite one. Um, I really like this because it, you know, really, really, yeah, zero stack. So it basically, yeah, again, confusing term, but in headsets, I think you know what I mean. So that gives you plenty of options. It means you're not running, if you go, from if you go, um, you know, extra space or, you know, something that protrudes from the bottom of the headset cup, you're basically propping the front end of the bike up, which can then, you know, eat into any number of dimensions. Um, se secondly, like I said, you don't any, it's nice to have something very low on the front. So you have more options in terms of fitting. Um, 
I think that's, for me, the best one. It's a nice compromise um, between um, something that looks good, operationally looks good, but also is very easy to replace and change altogether. And then you have integrated headsets where the bearing surface is actually part of the frame itself. So that angled um, face for the bearing to sit in is the frame. And I consider them spawn of the devil. I don't like them. They just rile me up all sorts. I think it's just, um, they're lighter, basically. That's their, that's their thing. Um, which is fine on road bikes and maybe XC bikes. But when you get to like 160, 170 mil bike and it comes to an integrated headset, I just think, no, 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 no. I think it, it cuts you short of options. It, if you want to fit an angle set, which might be important to some people, might be completely meaningless to others, but to me, I think that is an important factor in an aggressive bike. And um, yeah, nope, nope, nope. Integrated headsets, not keen. Although I'm sure some people love them because they are that little bit cleaner again. Now, the last question is from Sam Tozer. And they say they've been trying to get their air can off and it's been so hard. I've let all the air out and still nothing. Um, so a couple of different ideas. Make sure, well, not make sure, but I would suggest letting all the air out with the shock still in the bike and cycle it through its stroke because sometimes there can be still you know, 200 PSI charged in that negative air chamber, which is just going to be, you know, it's not, not in the same way that it's in the positive air chamber, holding that, pushing that, um, that air can off the seals, but it is going to be adding stiction, which is what we don't want. I would also say use alcohol to get better grip, better purchase. And once you've done that, I would say if you can get maybe a six more Allen key through the eyelet, spray alcohol on the can itself, wrap an inner tube around it. And then once you have maybe two times around with the inner tube, then basically get an eight mil Allen key and kind of turn it like this. And so you basically get a big inner tube knot and that can often provide enough purchase to remove the air can. Better yet, you know, get a strap wrench. But if you don't have one, you can have an inner tube, you can do it that way as well. But that is it for this week's Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you very much for everyone who took the time to get a question. And if you've got a question of your own, please get it in the comments. So hopefully we can feature it next week. Thanks guys, and we'll see you next time.